Welcome to this uh, webinar <clears throat> titled The Humanitarian Crisis in the DPRK, Solutions Moving Forward. What we're going to discuss is the fact that more than a year has passed since North Korea sealed its borders uh, in response to the spread of the uh, COVID-19, or at least that's what they announced. And this has led to increased difficulties, uh, I think, for, for the population of uh, North Korea. Uh, and uh, it has also uh, had an effect on the international trade uh, in and out of North Korea. And it has also hampered international humanitarian efforts. This is quite serious. <clears throat> and so it has, uh, has even uh, has cut off the DPRK even more than it was cut off before. Uh, and it has also increased or it has worsened the situation, or at least that is the guess for the population of the DPRK when it comes to uh, their living conditions, uh, how much food they can, they can access and so forth. And, uh, but what is very important is, of course, that whatever the situation, <clears throat> international efforts to uh, alleviate or to make it better for the population should be able to continue, uh, although it is difficult to get access to North Korea at the moment. This is something that we will discuss. We have a, a roundtable discussion with a distinguished panel consisting of uh, four uh, excellent speakers. Um, let me introduce them. <clears throat> I'll take them in the order that it has pre presented here. So if I Switch the order, please excuse me, from what you expect. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Kibi Park, who is the director of Korea Health uh, Policy Project at the Harvard Medical School. <clears throat> we also have Margareta Wallström, who is the president of the Swedish Red Cross. And we uh, are also happy to welcome uh, Mr. Dirk Gill, who is the senior country manager of Gavi, or at, at Gavi, the, uh, the Vaccine Alliance. And of course, we have a head of the, uh, the Korea Center at the ISTP, Dr. Sang So Lee. So I will now give uh, the word to, uh, by, beginning by giving the word to um, Margareta Wallström, who will um, give, uh, give a short presentation. And after that, uh, in, in the order that, um, uh, well, in, in a certain order, we will, we will have other presentations. After that, <clears throat> we will open up for questions and answers. Uh, so, but you can all already at this moment uh, post um, uh, questions uh, in the Q and A function, and I will look at them and, and later uh, present um, the questions. Um, yes, with that, I think I would like to welcome uh, everybody again and, and leave the word to Margareta. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Lars, and uh, good afternoon, evening, morning to uh, all of you who have joined this important discussion today. Um, I will try to share with you um, our perspective on today's situation by actually going back 25 years in time, the first time um, that I and many others in the humanitarian community engaged with DPRK, who was then the country which was then in a absolutely um, nightmarish hunger crisis after the collapse of its partners in the former Soviet bloc. And, and the misery we, went, we met when we came there and the ability that was actually given to both the Red Cross system and the UN at that time after the request of the DPRK leadership was the first major um, humanitarian relief operation. And I think m many of us who saw those grim images, those will never be forgotten. Um, after that, uh, most of us uh, then continued working. So we have a relationship, the Red Cross, with our uh, counterpart in Korea, North Korea, the DPRK Red Cross Society. Uh, that has developed um, excellently over the many years. But of course, there has been ups and downs in our relationship uh, with uh, North Korea. Um, there was, for example, a very, very difficult period when 
we could not really agree on what is so obvious for humanitarians, namely the need for monitoring and follow up of the international assistance. Eventually um, that was uh, solved and um, um, until a few years ago when this current situation started, that system built on the mutual understanding of what was necessary and why uh, the importance of uh, the international support to DPRK. And just to give you a clear sense, what, what's the sense, what is the core of the humanitarian assistance with the emphasis of humanitarian? It has all these years, it's been nutritional support to particularly exposed and vulnerable groups, young children, uh, elderly people, and only in very acute crisis has there been general food distribution, but not for many years now. Uh, public health support, and we, we will hear more about that for sure from uh, Dr. K. Park, not least about the need to strengthen the uh, public health system and the medical system in the country, which can probably not withstand a major outbreak of a pandemic. We in the Red Cross focus mostly on community health, rural clinics, uh, basic hygiene issues, uh, enabling people to preserve their health so that hunger does not become a deadly disease. Um, over the years, um, the partnership has developed well, and uh, uh, I think all of us have been able to travel to get to know the situation at, at local and community level. Uh, but of course, with the caution that um, comes with working in a country with a this nature of political system. But looking back at these ups and downs over 25 years, I must say the current situation is totally ex exceptional in every way. Going back one year, as Lars commented on, it's now a year ago when the country closed its borders for fear of the pandemic, which would in all likelihood take a terrible toll on the population there. Um, up till at that time, uh, the situation had not been so easy in any case. Humanitarian assistance financing had been reduced gradually over the previous 10 years. The UN sanctions regime, even though it has exception for humanitarian assistance, made it increasingly difficult to get supplies to uh, North Korea and also importantly for today's situation, the banking channel that would allow us to get cash in for our operational needs uh, basically were closed down and we had to carry cash to the country. So that was the situation already in the beginning of last year. When then the country closed its borders, no one could in fact leave the country for some time, locked down like everywhere else in their, in their homes. And, uh, of course, then our staff in country could no longer travel in the country and get the job done. Um, also, a few months later in the middle of the year, uh, last year, basically the imports of relief goods stopped as well. Uh, we heard of ships with, uh, with food that was in its way to North Korea that stopped because they would not allow to pass the customs checks. In the autumn of last year, we saw a, a series of very strong typhoons, and you probably have seen the images on TV, and uh, uh, which really destroyed people's crops, very destructive physically on, on roads and houses, which further, of course, undermined the resilience of people, particularly in rural areas, I should say. So with all this, and I would say in the beginning of this year, of course, we heard the messages of Kim Jong-un uh, when he also uh, talked very frankly about the economic difficulties of the country and tried to lower people's expectation on opening up and on the continued improvement that he seemed to have promised them before. So, so where we are now then, um, essentially, all international um, Red Cross people have left the country since uh, end of December. We continue when we look at what, how are we managing the situation? Well, we continue to have regular contacts with staff inside the country. We have monthly updates. 
digital working methods just as we do with everything else in the world, but of course not satisfactory in terms of being able to assess the situation as it is evolving. Uh, we uh, also have a very high level of preparedness because our assumption is from all the signs, reduced imports, the messages by um, Kim Jong-un to people and to the party officials about hardship, using the very lauded word of the arduous march, which is the way they refer to the suffering of people in the 1990s indicating that in all likelihood the economic situation is becoming really, really bad. And of course the people who will suffer most from this are the already vulnerable people in the rural area and the small towns uh, that are not really able to sustain their livelihood. And if the state rations are go going to disappear, as there might there have seemed to have been some indication this could happen, then um, people's possibility to really sustain the health will be severely reduced. So I would say at this time, um, as the way we operate is that we actually have made sure that we could restart our operations very quickly. If borders are open, if we can get supplies in and hopefully eventually also get staff in. Um, I would like to say here that we have not received any message that the country would not continue to welcome international agencies in the future once they have the pandemic behind them or the fear of the pandemic. Uh, once vaccinations work, after a period of possibly political consolidation in the country. Um, but uh, if I can describe what I see Worst case scenario, there will be an acute humanitarian crisis. But even if there isn't an acute humanitarian crisis, I'd say there is an acute resilience crisis because the people who will suffer most from this are the ones that are already the weakest in society, the ones that cannot access health facilities, young elderly people, people with other diseases. And the ambition from our perspective must be to reach them as quickly as possible through the Red Cross and community system. And in that case, the priorities will be, of course, nutritional support, basic health support, uh, continue to support the strengthening of the disaster response and preparedness system and pick up where we left, but also hopefully with, with appropriate resources uh, from the community. So we stand ready to act but we still have not got any message that we may be able to enter the country. There has been a half message though that possibly the import of goods may be possible as the middle of the country, but that is a very, very much a, a, a vague uh, rumor, I would say. Um, but just to conclude, uh, we are really concerned. We have serious reason to believe there will be an acute humanitarian crisis and we stand ready and stay in contact with our colleagues in country to ensure that we in that case can assist. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, I now leave the word to Dr. Park. Uh, <clears throat> I cannot turn on my video. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Laws. Uh, and thank you, Sang Su, for inviting me to this panel, uh, uh, putting a spotlight on this important topic. Uh, so in order to fully appreciate the current situation in the DPRK, we need to go back in time. So the DPRK should not be seen as a typical a low income country with a weak health system staffed by a limited number of poorly trained uh, healthcare workers. I think it's important to point out that prior to the Great Famine that uh, Margareta talked about in 1990s, the DPRK actually outperformed the Republic of Korea in some health metrics like uh, immunization rates. So the famine of 1990s was catastrophic. It destroyed the health system, erased much of the health gains. And the situation was so dire that at that point, the government sought external assistance and allowed the humanitarian organizations to enter the country like the Swedish Red Cross. 
And this went against the philosophy of self-reliance or juche. And as, as the conditions started to improve, some humanitarian organizations were allowed to stay and maintain programming in conjunction with the Ministry of Public Health and, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I would say that DPRK gets high marks for achieving relatively good health outcomes when compared to its income peers. And as I mentioned, in, in addition to the high vaccination rates, their maternal mortality ratio, this is calculated by the number of uh, mothers who, who, who die during uh, uh, live, live births. This is a measure of uh, a tr really a treatment capacity rather than preventive measures. Their maternal mortality ratio is actually better than most of its peers, and it's almost at the target set by the Sustainable Development Goals. They also have a robust health workforce. Some of them were trained abroad. And I, having traveled to North Korea for uh, over 20 times with my last visit in November of 2019, the doctors that I've worked with, and I'm a surgeon, so I operate with them, uh, they're excellent. They're conscientious. Uh, they're excellent clinicians. And they really do strive to do the best they can uh, for their patients with the limited resources that they have. Now, it's important to point out that the presence of these humanitarian organizations with their international staff requires a significant level of administrative capacity and presents a risk in a highly securitized country. The North Koreans have always weighed the benefits and the risk of having these organizations in country. And as the sanctions and external pressures began to cause increased logistical and regulatory barriers and cuts in funding, prior to the pandemic, the total international humanitarian assistance for the DPRK amounted to about 25 million per year. Uh, this is about a dollar per person for North Koreans. And for, the, for, for North Koreans, the benefits are getting harder and harder to justify. In addition to dwindling aid, political pressure from US and Japan was likely involved in the loss of global funding, global fund grant for the major tuberculosis program in early 2018. Now the grant was restored in 2019, but the North Koreans are getting increasingly less receptive to external aid. In fact, I saw this was in the news, Toward the end of 2019, the DPRK government actually asked the UN resident coordinator to significantly cut back the number of international staff in the country. Then the pandemic hit. And we're now more than a full year into the pandemic and we can make some observations about North Korea's approach to the, to the threat. First, the safety of the entire population, the protection of the country from the virus is far more important than the negative economic consequences of the isolation and worsening humanitarian conditions and the loss of external assistance offered by humanitarian organizations. In some ways, the population has been socialized and they're used to the scarcity from the massive sacrifices they had to make in order to develop their nuclear weapons program and missiles, a sacrifice that they considered necessary for their survival. And as uh, Margareta mentioned, I would point out the sacrifices they are now asked to make to protect, protect themselves from the current pandemic uh, had been compared to the arduous march of 1990s by the North Korean leader recently. Second, the strategy of zero risk may seem like overkill, but when seen as an existential threat in a state that's highly fearful, some of the measures actually are not so surprising. The people of North Korea are warned to treat anything that washes ashore as potentially infected by the virus. They are told to be careful of snow, dust storms. Uh, when a South Korean man uh, last summer swam toward the North Korean side last summer, right? They, he was apparently de uh, uh, trying to defect. The soldiers shot the man and burned him at sea. This was seen as someone potentially carrying the virus and since he came from the outside. Third, preparing for a possible large scale outbreak of COVID-19 by building treatment capacity is really, it is, is part of the overall pandemic preparedness plan, but it is plan B and they may never need it. DPRK has limited surveillance capacity due to the fact that they only have a handful of testing machines. That number is growing, but it's still limited. Knowing that the virus spreads primarily through asymptomatic people, unless you can test the entire population on a regular basis, community spread will occur. 
the best strategy is to keep the virus out as best as you can and quarantine anyone who is symptomatic and all of their contacts. This emphasis on prevention and maybe why they do not seem so desperate to obtain medical countermeasures, even when it's offered to them. Fourth, it is unlikely DPRK will reopen unless the risk to the population is virtually zero. I would not be surprised if the DPRK remains closed until the pandemic is declared over globally. Yes, the government did apply for the COVAX AMC program and submitted a national deployment and vaccination plan. However, it's not clear that they will actually accept the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine at this point, given the hesitancy by some countries due to side effects. And I'll leave this question to Dirk to answer. But even if they do begin vaccinations, there is no telling when the government will actually feel safe enough to open the country up to foreigners again. And if I sound pessimistic, it's because actually I am. Could there be a path to reopen the country on a limited basis for the most urgent humanitarian needs? Well, maybe. And let me see if I can uh, uh, sort of uh, take you through it. The country will need to assess its risks and benefits. And there are a handful of programs which are, are of high value to the country. Programs such as vaccination uh, will, need either, will either need to continue or actually be introduced, such as the COVID vaccine. Last summer, during the lockdown, when no cargo was getting through the border, the government actually gave special permission to UNICEF to bring in Gavi-supported vaccines for their children, and it got in. Similarly, they may have high priority for the continued supplies of life-saving medications for the tuberculosis program and hepatitis program, as well as WHO's essential meds program. So if you identify these high priority programs, the responsible implementing organizations could negotiate the entry of a small international team. Here, the key would be to assure the North Koreans that the entry of this team presents virtually no risk to the people of North Korea. A plausible set of measures can include things like verific verification of presence of antibodies. So not just vaccination, but actually test the people who are vaccinated to make sure that they actually possess the antibodies they were designed to produce. So uh, uh, antibody testing, a series of COVID tests prior to entry, during entry, and even after entry, and, and, a, and repeated in a redundant fashion uh, with, uh, with an ample time for quarantining. This may be sufficient uh, uh, to allow a small team of, uh, uh, to, to enter to test the effectiveness of this protocol. And if, it, if you can satisfactorily show the government that the pilot team does not represent any threat to the people of North Korea, then perhaps subsequent teams can be negotiated. So I'll stop here and look for, uh, forward to further discussions. Thank you very much. Um... I will uh, now leave the word to uh, Dr. Gil Gavi. <clears throat> Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for this uh, opportunity to um, start um, to participate in in this uh, webinar. Um, I will have a short presentation to fill the the ten minutes. Um, I will actually start by just introducing Gavi very briefly and then um, summarizing a bit uh, Gavi's support to DPRK. And then I will uh, conclude with a topic which is probably most interesting to, to most of the audience, which is actually um, the support through COVAX for an introduction of a COVID-19 uh, vaccine um, in, in DPRK. I will start um, sharing my screen with the presentation, uh, just a second. So um, I just would like to have an opportunity to, to briefly say what Gavi is doing since we're maybe not as well known as WHO or UNICEF or Harvard University. Um, Gavi's mission is actually to save children's lives and protecting people's health by increasing the equitable use of uh, new vaccines and that in, in lower income countries. And DPRK is obviously as a developing country a Gavi uh, eligible country and has received Gavi support uh, since the early 2000s. Um, 
we operate in a sort of alliance setup. Um, specifically important are the World Health Organization and UNICEF as implementing partners and in-country presence, uh, but also the World Bank and uh, without the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, Gavi would probably uh, not, not exist. But um, this includes um, a lot of other partners as well from the donor governments to the implementing uh, uh, country governments and civil society organizations uh, and so on. And uh, the Gabi Secretariat is obviously based in, in Geneva and uh, in a way facilitates and implements these programs and can also be seen as a sort of financing institution uh, specializing um, to support immunization programs. Um, we do this actually through um, a couple of, of instruments. Um, here you see a worldwide map and uh, the highlighted countries in yellow are all the countries which receive support and you will also find here um, DPRK. Uh, the major support or at least where most of our financing is spent is uh, the support for new vaccines, uh, but this is complementary um, with health system strengthening support and, and also tailored uh, technical support to the countries. Now, um, DPRK has uh, received uh, since 2001 Gavi support, and you can see here it has been health system strengthening a couple of vaccines, which is uh, majorly now actually measles rubella, the pentavalent vaccine, um, and uh, the inactivated polio vaccine uh, IPV. Um, what you can see here is that uh, the immunization program in DPRK actually is uh, still quite traditional and like the newer vaccines, uh, rotavirus vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, uh, HPV against cervical cancer, etc. have not been introduced uh, in, in DPRK so far. But the country has actually uh, indicated their interest uh, to introduce uh, such vaccines uh, from 2022 20, onwards. Uh, probably that will obviously be delayed with the delays we had seen in the last uh, year. Um, Dr. Park already mentioned a couple of uh, quite surprising uh, good health indicators for DPRK given its uh, income levels. Uh, I just summarized them here, maternal mortality or the under five uh, and infant mortality rates. Um, here, actually, the country really outperforms uh, countries which are in a similar income uh, bracket. Uh, below you see the bar graphs uh, of the immunization program and also the immunization program actually has uh, outstanding coverage rates. Um, for, for the pentavalent vaccine here labeled DTP3, we're around uh, 97%. Um, for, for the measles vaccines, we're around 99%. And also the polio eradication program has practically 99% coverage. And these this data relies on, on administrative data by the government, but it's also corroborated by actually uh, independent verifications and coverage and equity surveys uh, and so on. Um, this does now not include the nutritional data. The nutritional data, as um, we heard in the beginning of this webinar, is, is obviously uh, not at the level of, uh, of these indicators. Now, here's another example, um, which rather looks at the infrastructure, which is uh, very relevant for the performance um, of the immunization system. And this is the so-called uh, evaluation of effective vaccine management, which is a standardized uh, tool. And uh, this has been done recently uh, prior to the pandemic in the end of 2019. And DPRK with an overall aggregate performance um, of 82% in this assessment has actually a very well-performing supply and cold chain. Um, and this despite the fact that uh, most of the equipment is actually really aging and, and at risk and needs replacement uh, urgently, which also brings us uh, to the necessity of, of uh, future support. Now, um, having highlighted a few positive things, um, there are obviously huge challenges uh, in, in the health system or in the immunization system. Um, first of all, um, as we have heard before, the health system is very vulnerable to, to external factors um, like uh, the, the um, natural disasters, etc. Then under the current si uh, situation of sanctions, um, procurements and deliveries of humanitarian supplies have been delayed and have been slowed down. Um, high rates of malnutrition and high number of diarrheal diseases, that's also a general concern and can also actually compromise um, the immunity response of, of the immunization uh, program. 
Also, if we look more at the quality of services which are provided, um, there's a huge need to update policies, the guidelines, um, demand side interventions um, are actually not very evolved in, in DPRK uh, and uh, somehow need a, a reform. And this all needs to be linked to actually train uh, the, uh, the staff which is providing those um, uh, basic healthcare staff. Now, transportation system, uh, despite these uh, good scores of the EVM system, um, that's uh, still quite weak or at risk. Uh, we've seen shortages of essential medicines and supplies in, in the past years. Um, vaccines have so far not really been affected, um, but uh, it remains a concern for other um, areas. And um, there's also a sort of lack of uh, integration of um, service delivery mechanisms with uh, integrated management of childhood illnesses and emergency obstetrical care. Also, if we look at the very important uh, surveillance uh, system, um, uh, this is quite weak and, and also um, surveillance for immunization um, programs um, needs strengthening. Um, I mentioned that much of the cold chain equipment, um, specifically if we look at vaccine introductions which are planned or uh, even at the introduction of the COVID-19 vaccines, needs uh, upgrading or uh, replacement. Um, currently, it's somehow um, still functional on the basis of uh, improvised maintenance, etc. And, and that's quite remarkable, um, but um, it's, it's a high risk. Um, electricity supply um, is, is obviously a, a challenge. And uh, then um, we've heard that before as well. Uh, uh, vulnerab vulnerability to disasters like floods and droughts and uh, then the uh, pandemic of COVID-19. So um, to, to summarize a few other major risks uh, for, for the immunization program in DPRK, it's really, uh, if we look forward, the lack of sufficient funding for financing the critical components um, um, of uh, the EPI program, like the cold chain, uh, other infrastructure aspects, health management information systems, um, then the country has little capacity to actually co-finance um, new vaccines out of their national budget funds, uh, not only because of their um, overall economic status, but obviously also because of the, the UN sanctions and the economic impact, um, the natural hazards, um, and, and then um, the, the weak uh, in-country capacity um, for really uh, outbreak preparedness and, and response. Um, and uh, this has led to this uh, zero risk policy um, uh, with regard to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, um, if we look at um, actually DPRK and the support um, the COVAX facility and AMC can bring to the country, um, first of all, DPRK is um, a COVAX AMC eligible country and um, has completed the necessary steps to, to prepare um, to receive the support. Um, although still a couple of technical issues need to get sorted out. Um, COVAX has also confirmed um, a first allocation of the AstraZeneca Serum Institute of India um, vaccine uh, to the country, which would, as a first shipment, um, cover roughly 3.5% of the population with a full uh, two-dose schedule. Um, but um, first of all, there are delays of, uh, because of the global supply shortage um, linked to the Indian export restrictions. Um, but the, the Ministry of Public Health is also concerned about the vaccine safety and efficacy and, uh, of the uh, AstraZeneca and SII um, uh, vaccine. And uh, they are actually not really in a rush to, to introduce this. Um, and, and they're looking a bit at the experiences uh, which are currently uh, being made. Um, um, in, in other countries. Um, and then also um, such a vaccine introduction would lead to um, operational cost and um, how to cover these operational costs uh, is, is currently also not clear. Um, I also need to emphasize that actually COVAX offers support to cover up to 20% of the population. So what's happening to the, to the rest of the 80% of the population? And uh, one can do a quick... Um, back of the envelope calculation that uh, this will, let's say, cost uh, around $150 million um, of, of vaccines for the country. So 
from, from where is this financing gap coming um, since the country neither has uh, the budget funds, nor does it have access to um, other um, financial instruments like, like the World Bank or international de uh, development banks. Um, currently, technical requirements for um, a COVID-19 vaccine introduction also need to get sorted out. That's linked to the cold chain, but also to the trainings, uh, the legal issues, etc. And then what uh, we've heard uh, before specifically from, um, from uh, the Red Cross, we currently do not have any in-country presence by our UN partners, WHO and UNICEF. Um, and that would be actually quite necessary uh, for, for the technical assistance, uh, then for the um, preparation of the vaccine introduction through uh, staff trainings, but it would also um, be necessary obviously to monitor um, the vaccine introduction and the utilization uh, of the vaccine. Um, the UN sanctions, um, yes, they, they can actually um, in a way, be a sort of risk to, to operationalize this support. Um, I, I, we do not expect that um, this kind of vaccine support will not be exempted under the UN sanctions, but there's a process to follow. Uh, and, and then uh, obviously the, the lack of um, access to other financial um, support other than Gavi and COVAX uh, can be a bottleneck and um, this can, can also be um, in a way affected um, through the UN sanctions. Um, that's the end of my presentation and I hand it back to the facilitator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is now time uh, for Dr. Uh, Sang Soo Lee to uh, make a presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, in my presentation, uh, what I'm trying is to uh, talk more about uh, the North Korean perspective. I will touch upon three issues. Uh, first, why North Korea is refusing humanitarian aid. Second, uh, why North Korea is going to re reopen uh, its borders. The third, uh, what are the problems if North Korea will continue to uh, refuse international aid. Uh, my first question, uh, why North Korea is refusing aid? Of course, uh, North Korea remains extremely paranoid about the coronavirus. They said um, external assistance might bring the virus into the country. But I think uh, there are also political issues in North Korea. We know uh, North Korea has long-standing distrust of UN work. Uh, for example, even in the past, uh, North Korea abandoned uh, international uh, aid work in the country. For example, uh, in 2005, North Korea tried to kick out all uh, UN agencies in North Korea. Another example is uh, in 2019, just before the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, North Korea forced uh, all UN agencies uh, 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 to leave the country. I think from a North Korean perspective, uh, uh, the UN work attempted to interfere uh, its inter, uh, inter, inter affairs by politicizing uh, humanitarian assistance and linking it to human rights issue. But uh, I think there is also a leadership issue, uh, especially after admitting uh, the recent economic development plan have failed to improve uh, people's life uh, standard. The leader uh, feels uh, worried uh, accepting aid would be uh, perceived as a signal of weakness. So uh, reject of aid uh, under the slogan of self-reliance was necessary to uh, demonstrate uh, the, the leadership. Uh, but another reason uh, is um, uh, the UN 
always try to check uh, whether the food aid is delivered to the most ones in need. However, the monitoring work uh, is sometimes very sensitive to the regime, especially after the failed uh, nuclear negotiation with the US. Because uh, revealing internal, internal uh, situation uh, can be used for advocating uh, the efficacy of sanctions and criticizing the human rights situation in North Korea because of the regime's strict pandemic measures. Lastly, uh, North Korea has criticized the international sanctions they said uh, the sanctions are undermining humanitarian situation in the country and uh, uh, hampering the humanitarian work uh, in North Korea. I think uh, North Korea might think uh, the size of the aid is too small and uh, it is not delivered uh, as they want uh, because of the sanctions. Uh, so, uh, I think in the past, North Korea was more than willing to receive a large scale of aid, sort of a development aid, such as the UNDP uh, Truman River Project or Kaesong Industrial Project. But uh, for North Korea at the moment, the only way to solve that is to push for uh, sanction relief while uh, refusing the small size of the, the aid. Uh, my second question is when uh, or why North Korea is going to reopen its borders? Uh, good news is uh, there are some signals. Uh, North Korea is preparing for reopening its borders with China. Uh, for example, uh, in the India of March, uh, the Chinese inspector, uh, they checked uh, the safety of Dandong Shiniju Friendship Bridge, which is only one uh, available road connected uh, between North Korea and China. And then in March as well, uh, the Chinese worker repaired uh, the railroad track uh, so that international train between North Korea and China can uh, begin uh, running quite soon. And there is another announcement. Uh, North Korea adopted uh, a new uh, disinfection import law uh, to ensure a safe uh, entry of imported uh, goods. It seems um, uh, this infection equipment was already installed uh, at the customs in the border city of Shiniju. But bad news is I think the main purpose of reopening the border is not to deliver humanitarian aid to North Korea. If the border is open again, I think uh, mainly the Chinese products such as food, uh, building materials, and uh, raw materials in order to recover their domestic economy. Uh, more urgently, uh, the building materials uh, imported from China are needed for North Korean uh, construction se sector because the Kim Jong-un leader uh, recently promised uh, to build 10,000 uh, houses in Pyongyang area within five years. And other uh, large uh, tourism uh, project at uh, Samjian and uh, Wonsan uh, have delayed significantly because uh, the lack of cement, steel, and chemical materials. So I'm, I'm quite worried about uh, even if uh, the, the border will be reopened, uh, but North, uh, North Korea will continue uh, refusing international aid while uh, North Korea will continue to rely on China more and more. Uh, for example, uh, last week, North Korea 
uh, warned uh, the UN uh, organization uh, because uh, UN organization and the foreign uh, NGO uh, reported the, the UN panel, uh, North Korea saying that North Korean uh, children are suffering uh, with uh, malnutrition because of the uh, regime's uh, strict uh, regulations. Uh, but interestingly, uh, North Korea also sent a different message to UN. Uh, for example, uh, they want to work a strength cooperation with WHO. It seems to me uh, North Korea will choose uh, some international aid, uh, such as a vaccine and medicine, but while they are rejecting other humanitarian aid, such as food, uh, disaster relief supplies, or agricultural supplies, because they can get those uh, products uh, directly from China. Uh, my third question is, uh, uh, what are the problems uh, if North Korea will continue refusing international aid? Uh, Margarita also mentioned, uh, North Korean leader uh, mentioned uh, the country will face the uh, worst ever situation. Uh, he reminded uh, the 1990s uh, famine, uh, which killed uh, at least 200 people after following uh, after the, the serious flood in 1994 and 1995. Uh, last summer, uh, the flood and the serious typhoon hit uh, North Korea. Uh, the large agricultural land and uh, the many people's houses uh, were seriously damaged. But North Korea has been uh, influenced by such just natural disaster almost every year. I think uh, if the natural disaster will arrive North Korea this year again, I think the impact may get even worse than previous one because the North Korea economy uh, is already facing a crisis and everything is efficient uh, because of the, uh, the pandemic period. Uh, and even more risk uh, if North Korea will continue refusing international aid, uh, because uh, basically there are three things lacking in North Korea. First, uh, no uh, humanitarian aid workers in North Korea, because uh, this is uh, also an issue in the future the pandemic restriction will prevent for, uh, foreign uh, workers from returning to the country, even uh, North Korea when uh, they face this uh, serious uh, natural disaster. Second, there is no information. Uh, we don't know what is happening on the ground. Uh, this is a very crucial issue in the future because it's extremely difficult to communicate with North Korean partners uh, to discuss the future humanitarian projects. And then third, uh, potentially no donors uh, in the future because, uh, the, because of long-term absent of uh, humanitarian workers and monitoring system, the donor will lose uh, the in their interest in funding humanitarian project in North Korea. Uh, and then uh, there are so many countries uh, they need urgent, urgent international aid because of the impact of COVID-19. So the donors are likely to exclude North Korea uh, in their list of uh, aid group in the future. So the things are not very positive. Uh, even if North Korea could manage uh, the natural disaster like last year, but potential food crisis after uh, the floodings, uh, it's difficult to be handled by the regime itself. Uh, 
But of course, it is also depending on how much China could help North Korea. Nevertheless, uh, we need to think about uh, the, the worst scenario and how international community, uh, how we could react if such scenario uh, will arrive in North Korea in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for <clears throat> interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentations. Uh, we have uh, one question already um, under the q and I'll be happy to quote that uh, in a while. Um, but let me just ask a question to any of you. Um, how likely is it that we actually have zero cases of COVID-19 uh, in DPRK? And if, if, if this is so, and if the, uh, the lockdown or, or the closing of the borders of DPRK have been very efficient, and there are no infections, that means also logically that there are, there's no immunity. And uh, if the pandemic um, somehow disappears <clears throat> to a certain extent, at least in the rest of the world, I suppose that the, the virus could still be lingering around in, in some way or another. So the question is really, logically, doesn't the DPRK have to vaccinate everybody or a large proportion of its uh, population before it can open up the borders after, after having such an efficient uh, close down? I don't know if, if uh, Key, if you would like to address that question. Yeah, sure. So the prevailing opinion seems to be that North Korea's claim of not having any cases of COVID is really uh, not true, right? That seems to be sort of what, what people sort of, they, they undermine these statements. I, I actually think that they were successful in preventing the entry of the virus. Um, uh, their, their policies were enacted swiftly and aggressively and comprehensively. Uh, if you think about the lockdown, it happened even before the Chinese lockdown Wuhan, you know. Uh, so if you see if you, the countries that have, re, uh, uh, you know, responded successfully to, to the pandemic, it's the ones with the strong governance. And we can pretty much agree that DPRK's government, government is fairly um, strong, robust. So I think the, 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 the claim that they have zero cases is more likely than not. But I will sort of qualify that as saying, they may not know uh, because they don't have the, the, the comprehensive testing protocol that has, uh, you know, uh, the capacity to test everyone. So it's possible that there were out sort of pockets of infections that they were successfully able to contain because they can isolate these, these infections very quickly. And those could have been COVID cases and what, what no one would really know. Mm. But, but the, 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 the question then, um, <clears throat> If they open up again, aren't they even more vulnerable than before if they haven't really vaccinated everybody? I mean, even, even though the, the, the um, pandemic has more or less faded away in the rest of the world. So I think they have a two-pronged approach. One is to protect the population at all costs right now uh, from the uh, major outbreak. But the other is the vaccination uh, strategy. They, they really do intend to vaccinate the population and they do that, you know, for the children, right? 97, 98, 99% national vaccination rates. I think Dirk could, you know, really answer that question. Would you like to comment on that, Dirk? <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation. Uh, obviously, um, if they would open up, they have a high risk of importing COVID-19 infections. Um, and uh, if they open up before they have some sort of wide coverage of an immunization program or herd immunity, um, obviously the risk is even higher. So um, I think what, um, what Key Park um, described very well in, in his talk was that you need a sort of um, very stringent, coherent protocol of allowing maybe small teams to enter to start something like a COVID-19 vaccination program and build it up from there. Um, 
as long as so that's possible and if this can be then replicated or more or less move in parallel with with other um, very targeted um, either health or humanitarian uh, interventions that would be a, a good option forward i mean we cannot wait until everyone is immunized uh, in korea uh, because i don't know how they want to do it um, themselves alone without assistance and prerequisite for the uh, assistance is actually that that some sort of, of entry uh, of, of staff and, and support is, um, is allowed and possible. And technically it's possible. Thank you. Um, I will now turn to, uh, we have two questions so far from the audience. Um, one <clears throat> from Mr. Thomas Nordberg. He says, uh, dear panelists, may I ask you to speak further on humanitarian exemptions from the sanctions and uh, international emergency humanitarian aid to assist people in risk of starvation. I don't know if you understand the question uh, clearly, or um, does anyone would like to um, comment on that? Margareta, perhaps? Uh, yes. Um, no, it, the 1990s were really bad for uh, very broad sanctions, and uh, evidence is that. Uh, lots of civilian populations that the sanctions regime, the UN resolutions themselves actually said this is not intended to hurt the people, but of course it hurts people, it, it's a systemic issue. So then um, uh, as a result of some of these stories, it was Iraq, not least, but also other countries, Haiti, um, the concept of targeted sanctions, which then intended to um, hit individuals and restrict their ability to access their money in banks overseas, etc., to travel. Uh, I'm mentioning this because um, there is some competition, but uh, we normally look at the Korea, North, the DPRK sanctions regime as the absolutely strongest uh, historically. There is one competitor to that very, very broad, very wide, but there is also this very clear cut um, decision on exemption for humanitarian assistance. Now, the, the challenge with this is because we have UN sanctions, you have EU sanctions, you have bilateral sanctions by United States, and they all build up a sanctions regime that is really tough. So what we have experienced is particularly a couple of years ago, um, it was um, probably the toughest year, that first it took forever, it took a very long time to get the exemption, which was then only for six months. So once it was released, you hardly managed to get supplies into the country before the exemption was uh, actually <laughs> void. Secondly, the way they scrutinized, for example, for metals that could be have a uh, secondary use in arms race, for example. Um, they prevented us from taking in kits for uh, you know, local maternity clinic to assist women to deliver babies. And uh, very sort of simple tools. So this became so bizarre. Um, of course, we also tried to assist, I must say, in the 20... 2018, there was a real effort by some countries in the sanctions, um, in the Security Council, to at least make this, this um, administrative side of the humanitarian exemptions more efficient. Um, there is a second aspect of this, because it became more and more complicated, it took a long time. Uh, the banking channels became uh, uh, almost impossible to function. There was a huge business risk from supplier side. So suppliers do not just want to sell goods to us who are going, that are going to DPRK. They got stuck. Ultimately also there were uh, quite a lot of complications with checking all these things and compliance with the sanctions regime at the Chinese Korea border. So it was, let's say the intention um, was completely negated by all the political administrative um, uh, issues that built up. That aspect actually, uh, one of you, I think it was you, uh, K. Park, who mentioned the TB. 
Um, I think the TB once, um, and that was uh, um, with apologies to the countries concerned, but I think that was also the decision to let the TB um, vaccines come into the country again was an act of self-defense. Because you can think if TB spreads, um, and it was uh, very widely in DPRK, it will also go overseas with the North Koreans. It will spread to people who work in the country. Um, so that was a sign of actually, maybe we have to consider the punitive aspects of some of these sanctions. So there has been um, improvements. Right now, there aren't many applications for applying the humanitarian sanctions exemption because we can't get goods into the country. But when we do, it's mainly, as has been mentioned, medical supplies, vaccines. It is quite efficient. Uh, but then there are many other obstacles on the way. So I think you also asked if there was a major famine would there be sanctions exemptions? I'm, I'm quite sure, yes. The problem with DPRK is that they don't want to have the aid yet. And, and um, maybe they can eventually, as Sang So Lee says, maybe the Chinese will help them more efficiently. But I think in this, in this type of situation, the sanctions instrument, whatever we think about the politics of it, will actually be valid and, and there will be no, except for maybe administrative delays. WFP have over the years been able to supply uh, food assistance and nutritional assistance to the country. So it's a mix of politics, administration, business risks and, uh, and uh, other issues that make it quite complicated. Does anyone else want to uh, comment on that? <clears throat> um, well, if not, let me um, <laughs> ask, um, uh, is it possible for, for the DPRK government to pick and select um, of, of the international donors by letting someone in, but, but um, for some reason saying that, that uh, the other organization cannot come in. Will that, in your view, uh, uh, influence the, the accepted organization, uh, the decision of that organization to enter or not enter if the others cannot enter? Is it all at once or, or can they pick? What, what do you say? I don't know if you, if you ask me, um... Uh, probably it will not be that obvious. I, I can tell you a couple of times. I think in the mid uh, around 2005, it was the, at that time I was at the UN. At that time, the DPRK decided that they don't want to have humanitarian aid. They only want to have development assistance cooperation. And we got the same message last year, actually, from them that. Uh, they don't want to have this label of humanitarian assistance. And of course, this is absolutely rational from their side. But I think they are also aware of that politically, it's very hard to, um, for countries to give development funding for DPRK. This is part of the political dilemmas. So uh, probably um, more, more than saying we don't want that organization, they will give priority to, I think, uh, uh, key pack said to the medical, the vaccine, and, and very limited access to specialized teams for specialized things. And the rest of us will maybe not be given access unless we can do that kind of assistance. All right. <clears throat> um, I have a question here from Alec Force, uh, who writes, maybe you can, if I do. This you can see it regarding the persistent shortfall uh, of funding and contingent on DPRK being willing to accept aid. Has enough been done from your perspective to target funding appeals at the general public? I recently do donated money in response to the WFP's Yemen appeal, partly because I was reminded to do so by consistent targeting by the WFP in my social media feed. I haven't seen the same for the DPRK. Could more be done 
to therefore engage with the public through social media, are such private individual contributions a drop in the ocean, or could they potentially help fill the funding gap? Good question, or several questions, actually. <clears throat> I'll take a stab at that. Um, I think the potential for the general public uh, to help with uh, the, the funding shortfalls for humanitarian assistance for DPRK is huge. If you look at the diaspora uh, funds, uh, let's say the Ethiopians provide for from abroad for Ethiopian assistance, same thing for I think uh, Philippines. I mean, there's other countries that have you know, activated their 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 uh, their uh, diaspora overseas, and there's a you know a huge number of people I think willing to donate to uh, humanitarian efforts uh, at, a, at a general public level. Uh, and then UN just uh, did the WHO actually just created the WHO Foundation and that can accept these funds. UNICEF also has a mechanism for, for, for accepting funds from general public. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I think this is a, a great question and I would love to see that happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, anyone else? Sangsu or Dirk or yeah. Maria? Yeah. yeah, I I, I think, yeah, you know, I, I think we, we also, I think as Sang So also mentioned this, um, compared to other countries with uh, similar problems, what, what comes in as aid to DPRK now is so tiny. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's diminished catastrophically over the past 10 years. We're keeping track of it. And it's very hard to motivate governments. Big institutions are actually better. So I think if we, uh, but I think, uh, Kipak, you, you would agree with me. To do this, we also have to let the public, um, apart from the diaspora, they also have to get to know, they have to be able to link to people in DPRK. They have to understand uh, sort of their situation. They need to, we, we can see that images when, when we've been able to film and share people's daily life, yes, you get a positive response, but um, this type of fundraising builds very much on, you know, familiarity and understanding. The diaspora is important. Um, maybe, maybe they would be helpful. I, I think we, it, it's certainly not, uh, it hasn't been used for a long time for DPRK. For a while. I'm sure it was done in the 1990s, but uh, after that, I haven't really seen. No, of course, with, the, uh, with Yemen, there's a, there are plenty of reports and pictures of what's going on, but, but you don't have that with the DPRK. Um, they wouldn't like to, yes, go, go ahead, Key. <laughs> You know, Margarita, I agree with you. I don't think the North uh, the DPRK government would ever agree to a sort of a sponsor child type of uh, campaign. Uh, it, it, one thing that I've learned uh, by working with the North Koreans is that they they are very proud people, and they they are not uh, uh, they won't ask for handouts. It's just this is not the way they operate. They will take advantage of programs that are designed through multilateral platforms like Gavi and Global Fund. That's you know, designed to target certain you know, conditions and, and, and if they qualify, right? But it's never like knocking on your door saying, can you help us please? Unless the only time I've seen that happen was, you know, the, the 1990s during the, the, the famine. Um, so yeah, <laughs> hmm. I don't see that happening. Uh, do you have any comment, um, Dirk or? No, I think uh, I, I agree with uh, Margareta and, and he said, I mean, first of all, there's the advocacy aspect of DPRK that it's not well known and it doesn't, it's not a country which creates a, a lot of empathy in, in people, unfortunately, um, because obviously uh, the people of, of North Korea um, are very hospitable and, and nice to, to foreigners, actually, at least when I visit. Um, and the second thing is that, um, yeah, they are proud and I think um, they have all the right to, to, to be also um, in a way proud or uh, manage um, such such programs um, how they would like to see them managed um, and we have to ask the question even if we are able to collect the funds um, where does the rubber hit the road I mean how do you really implement then the funding in the country when we already have these kind of bottlenecks of channeling the funds to the country and finding organizations uh, which which can help in the implementation 
Um, so that's obviously also something which needs to be managed because it could uh, rather be counterproductive if a quick uh, impact is not seen by, by those who actually donated funds. And, and maybe they're, they're actually the UN foundations, it's a good example because funds are getting merged and then maybe the donation aspect is uh, not really so much in, in the forefront. And Gavi has also the, the global fund uh, mechanisms to actually merge uh, private and, and public funding. Um, so this can be explored. Thank you. Hmm. Thanks, so do you have anything, any comment? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, in my view, uh, there are two main obstacles. Uh, the first is the current situation is heavily influenced by North Korea's strategic agenda. Uh, because um, as Margarita said, uh, in North Korea's uh, perspective, they actually could choose some of the international aid because there is some competitions. Uh, and then uh, many organizations are now willing to, to support North Korea. This North Korea has much larger room to, um, uh, to selecting uh, as of their, what they want. Uh, and then the other uh, obstacle is uh, China. Uh, uh, Chinese has a different monitoring system uh, compared to other international organizations. Actually, much more uh, from North Korean perspective is much more uh, friendly to, to North Korea, to Beijing. Uh, I know that North Korea, uh, China is more concerned about the future stability in the country. Um, at the moment, it's even uh, it's difficult for China because of COVID-19, but uh, since we uh, can expect that uh, the, the, the border will be reopened. Then even if uh, the, there is no people-to-people uh, -to -people exchange, but uh, most of uh, humanitarian aid can, be, uh, can go to North Korea from China. So at this point, uh, I think North Korea still can have more <laughs> options uh, diffusing uh, international aid. Thank you. <clears throat> we have, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, several more questions. Uh, one from um, Jung ji uh, What role could other Asian countries, perhaps uh, Southeast Asian countries with long-standing ties with North Korea, play to prevent further humanitarian crisis in North Korea? Do you think that ASEAN, for instance, or members of the ASEAN could have any role to play that others wouldn't be able to do? Sang Su, do you have any <laughs> thoughts on that? Uh, when it comes to Asian countries, I'm, I'm, I'm firstly, I'm thinking about uh, how Southeast Asian countries have an impact on North Korea when it comes to the economic cooperation or humanitarian aid. Uh, at the moment, I don't see much their influence uh, because when, it, when we look at uh, Malaysia in relations with Malaysia, even um, in relations with Vietnam, it's not going quite well. And then again, because of China, uh, most of difficult in, in North Korea can be covered uh, by North, uh, Chinese aid at the moment. So I don't see any specific reason why North Korea is asking Southeast Asian countries for uh, humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, they, they broke relations recently with Malaysia, didn't they? Um, okay, we have <clears throat> one more question uh, from um, Sabine Burgat. Some researchers and aid workers have demanded a comprehensive review of the 2016-2017 UN uh, Security uh, Council sanctions and their impact on the North Korean population. What is the current status? Uh, to what extent is the question of a review discussed among political decision makers at the UN, especially also in Europe and, and the US? Uh, would anyone like to uh, comment on that? Uh, 
Yeah, can I start then? Yeah. This is a great Please. question. Yeah, because the, if anything that the, the pandemic has done is it really shined a light on the, uh, the, uh, the inadequacies of the exemptions process. And I would use that term loosely. It's really morally wrong uh, in, a, in, a, in a setting of global public health emergency to ask for permission to deliver aid. That, that thing is completely absurd. So that, that requires a, a clear review. And on the US side, when President Biden was inaugurated, uh, shortly thereafter, he published the um, National Security Directive Number no. 1, which has to do with restoring US's leadership in the global uh, uh, health and re uh, response to the COVID uh, pandemic. And one of the things they're reviewing on the US side is the, uh, the, the unilateral and multilateral sanctions as they uh, uh, impact the, the countries that are sanctioned in their ability to respond to, to, the, to the pandemic. So I think there are some kind of uh, mm -hmm. You know uh, synergies here to, to look at this uh, the sanctions and then and and what what modifications would be necessary, um, and I, I I hope this this actually uh, uh, makes it makes you know some difference uh, uh, moving uh, moving ahead. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you. Any other one? Yeah. Any can other? I, that's yeah. Uh, that's great news that the U.S. is actually reviewing both the bilateral and multilateral sanctions regime, as you probably know. Um, one uh, challenge for those of us who have tried to uh, give evidence to the impact on the civilian population has been um, a familiar one, um, the data and the willingness of uh, one of you mentioned that uh, DPRK had criticized the UN and NGOs for reporting to the UN sanctions uh, expert panel. Um, and, and I talked to the panel members and ask them why aren't they reporting on the humanitarian consequences and they tell us because no one wants to give us information <laughs> so so here is um, and i think you all understand the politics behind that uh, dilemma so i i but as you say if the us is actually doing this i think it opens an opportunity for also other countries to engage with it because it's it is absolutely necessary for DPRK, the particular sanctions regime, but it's also necessary for many other sanction regimes to look at the impact of civilian population. Again, uh, you know, it's done in the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement Conference in 2005. Um, they then passed a resolution on the topic of this fact, but then because of other issues, I think in global politics, um, the issue of, of sanctions and the consequences for civilian population has unfortunately um, been a bit in the background. A colleague of mine made a, a, a quick study of the state of this knowledge of the sanctions regime and he found that lots has been written in the past 10 or so years 15 years but it's mostly about the humanitarian agencies problems are working it's not about the civilian population situation so you have a big job to do here i think and i think it's great if we can all contribute to push it forward Thank you. Uh, just, yes. Thanks, so go yeah, ahead. Shortly, uh, I just uh, add uh, what uh, Dr. Park said. Uh, I totally agree with Dr. Park. Uh, the, although the Biden administration is still reviewing uh, his policy toward North Korea, but I, I guess uh, humanitarian activities is expected to uh, be included in his new policy, I hope. And then on the other hand, uh, the different approaches, uh, step by step, and um, the action for action approaches, uh, something are different from uh, Trump administration's uh, approach. So in this case, uh, if North Korea will consider a serious uh, step for denuclearization, maybe lifting sanction would be considered uh, as uh, Trump's uh, future nuclear negotiation agenda. Hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have a few more questions. We have nine minutes to go, um, but uh, a few uh, more questions here. Um, some of are related to the, the, the to your answers already. For instance, what are the prospects for um, U.S. humanitarian aid to North Korea under the Biden administration? And another, uh, regardless of the pride, uh, the North Koreans have 
that was just mentioned, could COVID-19 aid and in general humanitarian aid be used as a first step measure to spark talks with the North? Would it be possible for the US to pledge to ease sanctions to permit easier entry for teams and aid uh, in the North? I think basically you have answered that question already, but yes, go ahead, Guy. <clears throat> so I was very optimistic uh, when the, the North Koreans seemed like they were interested in getting assistance for pet to the COVID response, the vaccines, et cetera thinking that the humanitarian angle would be a, a pathway to reopening diplomatic you know, engagement. But I was wrong. <laughs> mm. the, 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 that's, I think that's one aspect, reaching out with one hand to help. But the North Koreans also see that the hostile policies of, of the US is exactly why they're in that, in, in, in the same, in, in that situation. You know, they sort of the, the US has their foot on the neck of North Korea and at the same time saying, can we give you some help with that? And, and, and for North Koreans, it just doesn't compute. And uh, Che Sun Hee, the you know the for, for State Affairs Commission, actually said, until the hostile uh, uh, policies stop, we're not going to talk to the Americans because Americans actually have reached out to North Koreans uh, since the pandemic, uh, since the new administration, and they refuse to talk. Things like you know extradition of a North Korean diplomat to the U.S. from Malaysia for 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 you know some financial dealings. I think with uh, had to do with the luxury goods. That's not going to go over too well when, when you're trying to talk with North Korean people, you know, the government. So, you know, and also delivery of, of, of military assets to, you know, South Korea, military exercises. These are all seen as hostile uh, policies. And we have to do a two pronged approach, you know, as, as suspend some of those hostile activities and at the same time reach out with, with a, a non politicized way to assist North Korea. All right. We have. Um... More questions, but two final ones. <clears throat> Again, one from Alec Force. How, how should we interpret Kim Jong Un's quite remarkable admission in recent speeches of the difficulties that people are facing in the DPRK? That is a dire economic situation. Why acknowledge this? Does it show some accountability? Does this bring hope that there is a genuine commitment on part of the government to help ordinary people, or is it merely rhetorical? Sang Su, do you have any? Thoughts on that? Yes, uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, but uh, as I know, uh, leader Kim Jong Un gave this speech to the low level of uh, party elites, not to the people. So this is a sort of a sharing responsibility or uh, giving more pressure to government officials. Uh, for me, it's not admitting uh, the severe uh, economic situation itself, but uh, because of this potential crisis, we need to prepare more, or we uh, we deal with this uh, uh, situation by more uh, secured uh, our effort or the more uh, our uh, yeah, yeah, attention. So uh, this is a warning sign and not that uh, admitting our situation is so bad. Hmm. All right, I think we have um, to end uh, by, at least from the, from the audience, um, uh, a, a question uh, that um, is also um, full of praise for you, uh, dear panelists. <laughs> It's, it, it, it runs, um, dear panelists, thank you for sharing information and letting us participate. Very admirable and informative. What would change the bottleneck issue? What could facilitate a shift in supply chain bottleneck? I think this is, the, the question is really, um, where, do we, where do we go from here? Uh, is, I mean, what's the, the next possible possible step? Is there anything that can can take the cord out of the bottle, so to speak, and 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 let things flow. Anything that uh, except I mean you have mentioned uh, several things already, but yes, Margareta. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure we can pull uh, sort of the cork out of the bottle just like that. The things, but for sure, um, if as also sang so uh, intimated. Um, they will, the country will open for goods importation in the middle of the year or soon. 
that is definitely a important step because I, I think we many of us have really worked on making the sanctions regime more efficient and I think we have important understanding from the states that are sitting there that at least the transaction from their side there is a huge amount of work going on to try to resolve the issue of the banking channel so i, I think if some of these things come together it definitely also will facilitate some of the the vision that uh, key also had on importation of vaccines and, and necessary and probably that's where it will start it will start with the most necessary most uh, critical needs of the country and gradually open up um, and that will also help us to understand what the situation in the country is when it comes to people's health and welfare thank you um Dirk, do you have any final thoughts <clears throat> No, I'm, I mostly agree uh, of, with the things with, which have been said um, in, in the UN sanctions. Uh, Gavi and, and partners also developed quite a lot of routine in handling the sanctions. So for really getting goods into the country, um, I think this can be managed. That would also you know, extend uh, to, to COVAX support. Uh, the banking channel to have maybe uh, options to, to make the life easier of institutions which work in the country. Uh, that could certainly help a lot um, and yeah otherwise i mean gavi we have a very limited mandate and we approach uh, things from a very technocratic side and uh, probably combine this with uh, silent diplomacy and that's uh, how we will continue mm. thank you sang so do you have any yes uh, one of crucial things is to reconnect the communication channel with both koreans because uh, now uh, all Western embassies and foreign NGO staffs, all they left uh, the country. Now, we are seriously, we don't have any uh, communication channel in North Korea. Maybe some North Korean embassies in, in European countries, they can play uh, contact role, uh, exchange information between uh, outsider and the North Korean. But still, it's very difficult. Uh, we need to any kind of functions like uh, email or a phone call. But still, uh, some of uh, tools are not working. <laughs> so uh, I hope uh, uh, North Korea also uh, realized this importance of communication. Otherwise, we cannot discuss about future uh, humanitarian projects at all. Yes, Lee, key. Yeah, just I love that question about is there like a one bottleneck that could be, you know, change everything? And I think there is. So, you know, we talk about the, uh, the loss of banking channel, the sanctions, exemptions process. These are all symptoms. These are sort of the, 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 the sort of the knock on effects of the root cause, which is the failure of US and DPRK to actually achieve peace. You know, if we change it, it, so one of the things I think we can do is, and this includes ASEAN countries or European countries, to pressure US to say, Let's end the war and change the intentionality of these two countries. Then all, all these pressure tactics and hostile activities will go away. All right. I think that would be the final word of this webinar. <clears throat> well, final words. I would like to thank uh, the panelists, uh, Dirk, Ki, uh, Sangsu, Margareta, very, very much. And also thank the audience for, for uh, patiently listen, listening to us. It's been great to have you here, and I look forward to uh, meet you again in this format, uh, for the time being at least. Uh, thank you so much and goodbye.